Mark Bailey, Head of Credit Strategy and Research at Fig Securities, live from Sydney. Mark, um, thanks very much for joining us this morning to talk in particular uh, about this uh, speech by Theresa May. It seemed to be the overarching theme was of a, and we saw the words behind her, a global Britain, that they're leaving the European Union, but they're not leaving Europe. She wants the best of both worlds, free trade agreements with everyone, including Europe. Yeah, good morning, James. I mean, I think you touched on most of the uh, the highlights of the speech uh, in your introduction. I think also importantly as well was that she said no deal was better than a bad deal. And as you rightly say, she is trying to navigate a very fine line to leaving the EU, negotiating with the EU to get a, a better deal uh, for Britain and also a better deal in the global markets as well. And that's going to be a very fine line. There was very little detail, again, in terms of how that is going to happen. There is also very little indication that as that negotiations progress, that Parliament will be involved. It, yes, they will get a, a vote on the final deal uh, in both, as you rightly say, in both Houses of Commons and also in the Lords before it is enacted into British law. But also there was no comment in terms of when Article 50 will actually be formally triggered. Mm. She is still saying, uh, has historically said it's going to be by, by March this year. But again, that wasn't set in stone. And again, there was no um, comment, even though the question was asked, would, what would happen if Parliament votes against the final deal? So there's still a lot of unknowns. And it was interesting that the, she decides to have this speech, not in front of Parliament, but she took it to Lancaster House. Now, those with long memories will remember back in 1988, Margaret Thatcher used exactly the same room to talk about uh, how Britain would be taken into the single market mm -hmm. back in 1988. So it's kind of a, a full circle in, in that regard. So that was probably a, a hat tip to Margaret Thatcher and uh, probably appeased some Thatcherites in the Conservative Party. But again, you know, in terms of the reaction that we saw in Sterling, I think a lot of speculators were positioned there for a bit more harder language in terms of the, the uh, the speech that she used but also as well I think it's pretty critical and, and, and people aren't really talking about it that one of the key factors for driving sterling higher was a, a, a significantly higher than expected CPI print both headline and core came in at 1.6 versus consensus of 1.4 and that really started the sterling rally because obviously it, it sets up the Bank of England for hiking rates faster than market consensus just on a you know a a clear lack of detail I mean these are the essentially the opening throws for what you imagine is going to be a rather um, uh, intense negotiating process with the leaders of Europe. I imagine she was very conscious of that and not wanting to put back herself into a corner with too many um, details because they haven't even started to negotiate. But what I did think was interesting was that there was the, the throughout the speech this sort of um, thread of threats if you like, that was there. I'll quote her. She said in terms of having a plan B, if we were excluded from accessing the single market, we would be free to change the basis of Britain's economic model. And she spoke about loose regulation and significantly cutting the corporate tax. I mean, that, I mean that's a shot across the bow for Europe. Absolutely. And let's not forget that it's, it's quid pro quo. You know, mm. the UK is the largest importer of goods from the European Union. So, you know, if, if the, the, the deal that is finally negotiated is, is so bad that it, it backs Britain into a corner and they, they tear up any kind of negotiations, any kind of trade with the European Union, it's not just going to be bad for Britain, it's going to be bad for the European Union. So both sides know that. And so it's, it's a matter of compromise. But equally, the European Union can't be seen to be given the UK an easy path, an easy deal, a better deal, because otherwise there's going to be other countries that look at Britain and go, hey, maybe we should go down that same path as well, look after our own, negotiate a better better trade agreement, and the whole single currency starts to fall apart. But you're right, you know, she, Britain is trying to position itself in a, in a strong, um, in defensive manner in terms of how it's going to negotiate with the European Union. Equally, it said, look, we're open for negotiations. We've got no set positions on, on this, but it does mean that the, the four principles of freedom we cannot accept of the, of the free market in terms of good services, people and capital, we're not prepared to accept that because Britain has voted six months ago and it wants control of its, especially of immigration and especially of the laws. You know, it doesn't want yeah. to be accountable to the ECJ, the European Court of Justice. It wants to have the laws made for Britain 
and ruled on by British British courts. Um, and you know, there's also the fact in terms of how it's going to formalise the agreements with Wales, Ireland, and Scotland as well in any kind of uh, devolu uh, devolution of uh, power to those centres as well. And then how Scotland and Wales and maybe Ireland also pick up their uh, own agreements and negotiations with, with Europe down the line as well. So it, there wasn't a lot of deal, you know, uh, detail in, in, the, in the talk. And we've, let's not forget, we've, we've had six months of thinking about this and, and you know, the, the devil is in the detail. And I think a lot of this is going to go behind closed doors and we're not going to get any kind of detail. She said that she doesn't want to have a running commentary on that and we don't want to be kind of um, you know, talking about the finer details, and, and but Parliament will get a vote. So I think she's essentially headed off what was likely to be a Supreme Court ruling in terms of the fact that, that, that the UK government and the UK um, procedure for changing legislation such as uh, repealing the, the European Union Act and triggering Article 50 would have to have gone through Parliament. The High Court has said that's the case and that would probably likely to be uphold, upheld by the Supreme Court which is due to probably ruling that in the next coming weeks. Mm -hmm. So she's headed that off by saying it's got to go to, to both houses of Parliament for do, the final vote. Do you think in the near term